And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, <clears throat> and with me I have a newcomer here into the temple, creator of the upcoming... Cup, upcoming Metroid, Metroidvania me, meets Puzzle, and, and a man who carries around a sword that, by all accounts, is, was nothing more than a heaping mass of iron. The one and only Jack Breen. How are you doing today, man? I am doing very good, and I am excited to be here. Yeah, I had, I had to get the Berserk joke out of my system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most people do. Yeah, I'm glad that um, it's funny because I... Uh, I like Berserk, but I actually I hadn't like really seen much of it um, until after I had started this project. So most people think that I'm like a huge Berserk fan, and in reality, I'm kind of a, uh, a Berserk uh, newcomer. So, but I'm glad that so many people uh, make references so often. Everybody, everybody, um, everybody's a rookie at some point. Yeah, no, I saw the. Uh, like the three main movies uh, a couple months back one of my friends showed them to me and I thought they were great so I was a, I was pretty much an instant fan so I'm going to have to catch up on the rest of it um word of advice don't watch the do not watch the tw the 2017 anime yeah I've heard that that's like really bad I've seen some stuff from it it just looks like awful so <laughs> yeah there's a whole there's a whole story that can that can be told regarding why that turned out the way that it did. Mm -hmm. But suffice to say, you had some people who were in places they had no business being in. But, in terms of like the production team. <laughs> well, one of the one of the directors had never done had never done an action series before. Okay. He had most he had mostly done slice of life and rom com stuff. Yeah, that seems like not the right fit for that. <laughs> and second, I've always when it comes to when it came to the the art styles of the Sane and Big Four, as it's known, um, all all four of them have a very have a very detailed style that's hard to put into animation unless you want to spend money. Mm hmm. Yeah. And. For the record, the the other the other parts of the big four are um, Kingdom, um, it's, the King. Jeez, why am I why am I blanking on the big Kingdom, Vagabond, Berserk? Oh yeah, Kingdom. The four are Kingdom, Vagabond, Berserk, and um, Vinland Saga. Mm hmm. The big four in terms of like of like current uh, like action series or. Um, within the, within the, with, as far as revered, um, Seinen manga. Um, oh, okay. Seinen is essentially the older brother to Shonen. Yeah, I see. Uh, but getting, getting past that, now, Gig, now, Gigasword, it, you describe it as an action puzzle, Metroidvan Metroidvania. Um, mm -hmm. what? The vibe that I got when I first saw it is that it is that it felt like this was that this was built in an, on an idea and just seeing how far that idea can go. Was that kind of the origin story of the project? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that. So um, one time I was hanging out with a buddy of mine, and uh, he he's also in the game design field. He he does three D modeling. He's not like an indie developer, but he likes coming up with you know game ideas every now and again. And he was like, yeah, like, I feel like it would be cool, like, to make a game, or, like, if somebody made a game about, like, you know, uh, like, a platformer with a with a buster sword. And uh, that was kind of all he said, and it got me thinking about, like, you know, ideas, you know, revolving around that. And so the main mechanic of Gigasword is what I came up with that day was, like, oh, well, you could, you know, it's heavy, so if you put it in the ground, then you jump higher. And that's kind of all I thought of, and that was actually back in, like, 2016. And, uh... I kind of just kept the idea on the back burner for a while, and then in um, 2019, I um, 
I had been working on some demos for some random things, you know, I was trying to get something off the ground and I kept kind of choosing projects that were above my skill level. And I was like, I, I need to kind of take a step back and make something that like, you know, I can handle right now, like kind of pursue something that is simple, at least for now. And, um, and Gigasword ended up being what I fell back on. I was like, oh, well, like, you know, I know how to make platformers, you know, to some extent. Um, I feel like this is something I could handle. And, um, yeah, it really just kind of spawned off of that main idea. I was like, you know, you could stick the sword into devices, right? And it's heavy, so you need to move it around the rooms. So what are the different ways that you could move it around? And, you know, I was like, well, what I could do is just make it a Metroidvania where there are a few different areas, and each area focuses on, you know, different contraptions that move it. And, uh, you know, that idea has kind of evolved pretty heavily where now, you know, the areas are going to... The ideas that I came up with in the beginning were all pretty simple, um, and uh, all of those are now pretty much what's featured in the demo. So, like you know, in the demo, it's all pretty simple stuff. Like you put the thing in, a, you put the sword in like a uh, an elevator block that transfers it up. You can put it in the, the the crank platforms and then crank that platform up or down or whatever, or move it that way. Uh, there are the push blocks where you need the sword to be able to push the blocks to kind of make platforms for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and th yeah, so those are all like very, very basic ideas. And uh, as you move through the rest of the game, uh, I want it to get, you know, quite a bit more complex. And then also, because it's a Metroidvania, you're going to be unlocking new abilities, which will kind of, um, you know, control the progression throughout the world. So, um, you know, you're going to get like the charge attack to break certain walls. And then that mechanic might be combined with other level mechanics. So, um, yeah, I've got a lot of ideas for how the sword will be used, and it's pretty much just that each area uses it in a different way, and then, you know, combined with the different enemies that crop up and the different kind of uh, other environmental puzzles that, that come up, um, I think it's gonna, you know, I think uh, it'll be enough that, it, it, that the idea will always be changing as you're going through the game. Mm -hmm. Now... What was your first introduction to the Metroidvania concept? Um, I mean, I've always loved Metroidvanias. This is my first time making one, actually, I, although I have always wanted to make a game like this, so I had always been attempting in the past to make um, really, like, Zelda-style games. You know, like, the first game I ever tried to make was, like, a, a Link to the Past-style type of thing. And uh, obviously, because it was my first game, I just didn't get very far. But that's kind of always what I've been iterating on. And, uh, you know, in terms of some of my favorite Metroidvanias of the genre, you know, I love any of the Metroid games themselves. I love Axiom Verge, uh, Gato Roboto, um, God, what are some others, you know? Um, Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow, you know? So um, I've always enjoyed the structure and... I love Zelda games, and I feel like Zelda games... I feel like Zelda and Metroid kind of go hand-in-hand, hand, and, and I don't know if there's a discussion, you know... I don't know if that's a common debate as to whether or not Zelda is a Metroidvania. I mean, some of them are closer to that formula than others. Um, I feel like you could make the argument that, they're, that they kind of are. Um, but regardless, just like the overarching formula of getting new abilities and exploring this world kind of in a non-linear fashion uh, is has always been, you know, my favorite kind of gameplay, especially for 2D games. So, yeah, I, it was kind of just the obvious choice for me. I just have always wanted to do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, in, that in that same vein, when it comes... I, I should note that I do, I do find it kind of funny that over the years... Some people have tried to rechristen the Metroidvania genre as search action, but it's never stuck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that certainly ha it. Some people have tried, but no matter how hard, no matter how hard you try to, to make yourself catch with your right hand, if you're left-handed, you're gonna ca you're gonna catch with that left hand. Yeah, yeah, I've I, I've seen some people that like kind of like, uh, they get all mad about, like, the term Metroidvania. They're like, oh, like, you know, I don't know if they want it rebranded or if they think that it doesn't apply anymore or what, but, um... And then there are the other people that say, like, oh, we have too many Metroidvanias, like, why do people keep making these? And it's really, it's like, it's not 
it's not very niche. Like, you know, as long as you're making a game that is non-linear, has this open world that is kind of opening up as you progress, I mean, you can, you know, dig through the weeds and, and choose when something becomes a metroidvania like you know if you you know if people want to like gatekeep and be like oh this isn't a metroidvania unless it has these certain qualities then you know i guess people can do that but um in my mind a metroidvania is just something that you know i made a video about this one time it, i i called it the three pillars of metroidvania design and you know i i'm not an expert on this so you know it's it's not like my word is the final word, but in my opinion, what I said made a Metroidvania what it is was maze-like design, backtracking, and uh, oh god, what was the? I made this video so long ago. Now I'm forgetting my own thing. Um, but it was you know, I, and I think you know abilities like you know finding abilities throughout the world and and that sense of progression where it's like. You know the world is because it's 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 different from an open world game, right? An open world game is just you can go anywhere at any time, and there's still arguably like a progression if there's a story attached. Mm -hmm. But a Metroidvania is not that way at all. Like a Metroidvania is actually usually very linear, and it's just they disguise that linearity with the way that it's kind of handled. Um, and some some games open up a bit. Some games have a bit more freedom than that, you know. Um, some games allow you to uh, make multiple decisions at once, and that's kind of how I want Gigasword to be. Is you know I don't want it to be. There is an order, obviously, to things, but um, I, I also want there to be like secret areas and and sub dungeons that you can do, uh, so that it kind of always feels like the path is branching and you're not quite sure exactly where to go, and um, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that the term Metroidvania applies to a lot of games as long as they are, um, like I, like I just said before, like, you could arguably apply it to Zelda, so I think that, you know, when people say that there are too many Metroidvanias, it's really just because it's such a broad, you know, topic if I'm being on, If I'm being honest, more often than not, when I hear people make that kind of thing, I keep get it comes, it always comes off as performative jadedness. Um, mm -hmm. cause, because mostly because I've been here before, I've heard yeah. I've heard this I heard this exact thing when it came to so-called Doom clones. I heard it again it, um, when it came to Street Fighter clones. I heard it again when it came to um, Cotwet, when it came to Call of Duty clones. Um, when you ha and the fact that the fact of the matter is, games like Super Metroid and Symphony of the Night. And as well as well as um, as well as the works of Looking Glass, like Ultima Underworld and um, System Shock, have mm -hmm. been massively influential to yeah. to several generations of of game designers. And when those people are are at a position where they're going to be able to make their own games, they're going to make games that are based on stuff that inspired them. Right. That's yeah. Oh, um, is I do a lot. You've probably seen, but I do a lot of stuff with tabletop gaming. And mm -hmm. I had to put up with this exact argument in 2004-ish when um, Tome of Battle, the Book of Nine Swords, came came out. And some some people were aghast at the idea of D &D take, a D&D &D book taking inspiration from manga and taking inspiration from video games. And what I had said is that, th is that this isn't a shock, this is an inevitability. You've got a lot of people who did not quite grow up on Tol who did not quite grow up on Tolkien, on Moorcock, etc., the way that Gygax and Arneson did. They mm -hmm. they grew up on they grew up on other sources. They probably grew up playing Final Fan they probably grew up playing Final Fantasy two at well two as we knew it at the time, or si or six, or or um, grew up with cer with certain fa with certain fantasy manga, or grew up with the likes of Harry Potter. And their and eventually, when they became designers, their work was going to reflect that. Right. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it is funny to see that. Um, I'm not a huge D and D player, but yeah, I, I definitely get what you're saying because early D and D would have, you know, back in the day, you know, Tolkien really set the foundation for 
all that stuff and so it's clear that that's where the inspiration was going to come from and now that medium has evolved so much and yeah the people who are writing those books the people who are in charge of of pushing that medium are getting their inspiration from newer sources and uh and it's a good thing because you know if, if we copy tolkien for the rest of our lives nothing's ever going to be interesting again so um and that's that kind of this is kind of off topic but it's the same idea that you know i always think it's funny when people say like you know w w when it comes to anything fantasy related i mean really when it comes to anything fiction related but in terms of this argument when it comes to anything fantasy related and people try to like redesign certain aspects like if like if you make elves in your game but they're like totally different than elves have ever been before and then there's always those people who come and they're like oh like elves don't act this way or like this isn't this isn't how they are it's like well no like they can be whatever you want them to be like they don't act that way in the in in the way that you're used to but that doesn't mean that we can't change it just because that's the way it's been for 50 years like there are no rules and it's good that there are no rules there shouldn't be um I'm am right in the middle between rules and no and no rules. I've always mm -hmm. I've always been of the I was been of the idea that, um, no rule no rules is just as is just as bad as dogmatically approaching rules because you need you do need some kind of structure. Mm -hmm. At the same at the same time, what you don't need is what I like to call design by gospel. Yeah, um, I think that's kind of what I'm referring to. Yeah. Doing things a certain way because we've all because we've always done things a certain way, um, mm -mm. and to bring this to use a Castlevania example, um, when Lords of Shadow came out, a lot of people were d were decrying it for being too linear and not being in that Metroidvania style. I I defended it because my my argument was Mercury Steam at the time made very clear that they had absolutely no interest in emulating that um a ega style game their primary inspiration was super castlevania 4 mm -hmm. and i didn't think it was fair to compare them against the standard they were not interested in me in meeting to begin with plus i resented the idea that a castlevania game has to go down that route that's yeah, a, no, I I think that that's a good point, especially if they if they didn't like if they sought out to uh, not even follow that formula from the beginning, then you know people shouldn't have been surprised when it turned out the way it did. And obviously, with the later games, they tried to follow that formula, and it didn't work out as well, probably because that wasn't in the in their initial design. Mm -hmm. Oh. That and that and trying to please both both um, sides of the argument, and as you've no doubt seen plenty of times, when you try and please everyone, you please no one. Right. Yeah. Definitely. That be that being said, um, when it when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the idea the idea of of messing around with the Buster Sword. Something that I f something that I find amusing on that front is the is our protagonist in this is is swinging the thing around one handed. Yeah, yeah. People people have commented that before. They're like, "Oh, like why? How can he do that if the whole point is that it's heavy and it's like I don't know because it's a video game. Like it's the, the like the way that I see the, the Giga Sword is that you know this is a very like you know." Um, how do I put this? Like, you know, the, the mechanic exists for the for the puzzles. Like, um, you know, so if if I if 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 we were to go ultra realistic with it, it would just kind of lose what it is. Like, it's supposed to be a very retro inspired game and also just a very fun loving game. Yeah. Um, you know, with Shovel Knight being the biggest inspiration, so you know, realism totally isn't. Uh, at the top of my to-do list when it comes and to this stuff. So to be honest, I I find realism to be overrated. I yeah, am, definitely. I would ra I would rather um I would rather go with I'd rather go with the the mantra that I have is believability over realism. Like yes. presented in a, like what why is the sword so big? Because it was made for somebody who's eight. It was made for an owl man who's eight feet tall. Mm -hmm. And your and our prote and. Our protagonist is not eight feet tall. Yeah. So that you 
that isn't that is that kind of in universe consistency. Yeah, the other uh in like the other lore reason for why he is able to for why he's like he's not necessarily the only human that could wield there are other humans that actually that you'll see in the game who who wield very big weapons, but uh, you know, Ezra can wield the, the Gigasword because um, he's been friends with Omari for most of his life, and uh, Omari taught him how to how to use a sword. And Ezra would always try to pick up the Gigasword and like swing it around and stuff. So ever since he was a kid, it's kind of like a very anime esque like backstory, where like a very like One Piece style backstory, where it's like you know, even though this, this thing weighs so much, and even though he's just a kid. Uh, he's able to pick it up just because, like, he's been trying to his whole life, and, like, so he's just, like, gotten strong that way, so that's kind of the level of realism that I'm holding it to, is just, like, there's a reason, but it's obviously it wouldn't happen in real life. Mm -hmm. And the within the, within that, um, well, I did, well, I did, I did at one point joke that the, that that it's the is the best designed escort mission that I've seen in a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I'm pretty sure you've heard that joke about Gigasword at least once. Some people have have said that. Yeah, they're like, oh, this feels like an escort mission, or it feels like the sword is its own character, which I think is really interesting because uh, I didn't really have that in mind when I when I, I mean I guess the whole escort thing I that is kind of the basis of it. But it's interesting that people see the sword as its own character, and I've heard people say, like, oh, when you leave the sword in a room and then you go do stuff and come back, like, you feel so happy that you've been, like, you feel like you're being reunited with, with a, like, a part of yourself or, or with, like, almost even another character. Um, and I think that's really cool, because it makes sense, and it's not exactly something that I, um, that I saw coming for, for people to react that way. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in mind, when it when it came to launch, when it came, the other thing that I, the other thing that I um, that I ended up saying is that when you don't when you don't have this when you don't have the sword and you're not able to defend yourself, um, it almost turns into a kinder Prince of Persia. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I haven't played any of the Prince of Persia games, but I you know I've seen them throughout the years, so. Uh... But yeah, once as soon as you drop the sword, you know it becomes, uh, you know, avoid the enemies, and there's probably going to be a lot of platforming. So yeah, the focus really sh shifts. I'm specifically referring to the original Prince of Persia, which could be a little um, unkind. Yeah. Oh, which is which is a way to say that it that because of how animate. Because of how they dis how animations work, then having no animation canceling, mm -hmm. there's uh, there's going to be some bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. There's going to be some prime grade bullshit. Yeah. And but it but at the very least there is there isn't that as much he it, in the in this case. Mm -hmm. Um. But one. One particular, but because of the fact that there's far more of a puzzle emphasis than in a lot of other Metroidvanias, one there. This is where there's one particular thing that I I feel I have to ask about because mm -hmm. it's it's some it's something that can happen in puzzles and is the reason why um why a lot of point and click games have been my whipping boy for most of my life. <laughs> yeah, I have a term that I call hand breaking. Basically, the polar opposite of handholding. It's where the solution to an obstacle is um, far too obtuse to be reasonably, de reasonably detected without foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. um, the King's Quest games are notorious for this th kind of thing. Um, or some, or some of, I'd say one of the, I'd say, if you need a Zelda example, Death Mountain and Zelda Two. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where, like, a sp like just, like, the kind of those old cryptic puzzles that would be in, like, either older games or, like... There's still some of that in, in From Software games, honestly. I mean, less or so uh, as they've, uh... As they've grown, but definitely in, uh... I mean, From Software gets away with it because it's usually, like... Uh, their, their most cryptic p 
puzzles or, 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 you know, they're not really puzzles, but their most cryptic moments are usually not uh, mandatory things that you need to do to beat the game, so, like, it's kind of okay because it's all optional. But um, I definitely know what you mean, yeah. Um, and would it, I know that you're. I know that there's a lot of there's a lot of puzzle basis, but has there has has there been a good amount of emph, a has there been a point of emphasis to make sure that the um the potential path to a solution is something that's easy, that's relatively um visible. Yeah, I mean the way that I approach puzzles in Giga Sword is you know. You introduce a mechanic, and, you know, it kind of just... How can I put it? You know, you, you... So let's take the monastery, for example. So all of the puzzles in there are basically based around the push blocks. So you start off by just having a room where you, you push the blocks just to get up higher, and there's not really any puzzle. You just are introduced to the idea of them. And you push the block, and then you climb a, a ladder and get a chest and whatever, push another block. So now you know that those exist and you know how they work. Mm -hmm. um, in the next puzzle after that, the um, pressure plate doors are introduced, where um, you need to push a block on top of the, the plate to keep the door open, you know, which is a pretty you know uh, basic concept in these kinds of games. So... <laughs> Um, people, you know, are automatically pretty familiar with that, and they kind of understand what they have to do. Um, you know, as you go through, and then the, uh, the, the respawner things are introduced, where there's, like, that glowing portal that you touch, and then it respawns the cubes, the, the, the blocks to where they start off. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me, as the designer, my, um, biggest, uh, challenge is making sure that people don't get stuck, and that the puzzles, as you go on, are challenging, but that it's never to a point where people, you know, throw their hands up and walk away. Um, and so I think, you know, where Gigasword has its, um, its, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where it has the advantage is that the puzzles aren't going to be like these cryptic weird things where it's like, oh, like, you can only do this if you, like, uh, kneel in front of this wall with this item. Like, you know, there's none of that in this. It's just like, hey, like, like there are these contraptions and it requires the sword and one way or another, like, you're always going to know what you can do. And I think that's where those games fall apart, is that, like, the reason that you didn't know in... I forget, I think it's in Castlevania 2. It's, like, where you have to, like, kneel in front of, like, a cliff with, like, a crystal or something. I, I'm probably butchering that. I read it in Nintendo Power years ago. Mm -hmm. But that was, like, that game's hardest puzzle. Cause, but, 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 and, and the reason is because it's, 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 like, who would know that you could even do that, you know? In Dark Souls, for example, you know, they, they make it clear that some walls can be hit and that they disappear. So that's, like, you are introduced to a concept and you're like, okay, well, now I know to look for that. But if if the game never shows you that you can do something, then you're never gonna figure it out. So you know everything in Geek Sword is is made clear that like the solution is something that you've done before, and it's not gonna be some weird thing that only happens once. It's not gonna require some offhand item that you like almost didn't find or whatever. Uh, so I think that's kind of where it has its advantage. It's just that. Um, you know, a lot of the puzzles are very Zelda-inspired, you know, from the later age, you know, like, like picture the puzzles from Breath of the Wild in the shrines, like, it's all stuff like that, you know, so I, I don't picture people, you know, getting too stuck to the point where they would give up, like, I think as long as you're into, like, puzzle solving and dungeon exploring and whatever, that most people will be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, with the I should note that another another infamous example of the of the, of that handbreaking, the mm -hmm. um, the tornado the tornado thing the tornado thing in um Castlevania two. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. You have to hold an item, crouch in a specific spot, in okay. a specific spot, so that a tornado picks you up. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was referencing before. Yeah. Oh. And in that, and within that, 
I think it'd be fair. Of the, I think it'd be fair of me to say that any upgrade that you get with the Giga Sword, or any upgrade that you get, period, is going to have a double. Is going to have at least one of two uses: either tra either traversal or um, either traversal or unlocking, and of course, of course, some um, combat. Mm -hmm. Oh, and look, looking at some of the gifts that are on the ki on the Kickstarter page, that's definitely something I'm seeing. With cer with certain ones, including the fact that you just couldn't resist yourself from get from go from going with an equivalent to a grapple beam, could you? No, I I wanted something in there so badly like that, and uh, that's really like the only. I don't want there to be too many items that don't revolve around the sword, um, but that's one of the few that is like just not connected to the sword. It's like you just get a grappling hook. Um, and I mean, I might make some changes to it as the, as development goes on, but uh, no, I mean, I just I I really wanted to have something in there like that, and uh, I came up with the idea for like that scorpion enemy that you can only kill with the grappling hook. So uh, I knew it was something that I had to put in there. Mm -hmm. Now, when I saw, when I saw the up when I saw the upgrade tree for the for the thing, um. And the and the resource that's used to that's used to buy those upgrades. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. A couple of things that I wanted to ask. One, would it be necessary to but to um get ev to get every? How could could you go through it without without getting a whole lot of upgrades in that tree? And two, um, how do? You, is, are there going to be other things to spend to spend resources on, or is it just that up, that upgrade setup? Um, so to answer the first question, all of those upgrades are optional. So it's basically just moves that you can buy to kind of make the game easier. And I would imagine that in the future, people will probably do like you know to make it harder for themselves. They'll do like no upgrade runs through the game mm -hmm. where they you know forego that stuff. Um, yeah, it's just all optional abilities like different attacks and uh, some other stuff that I don't want to spoil. But uh, yeah, um, in terms of the, the ore, the resource that you get, um, yeah, ore is initially used to purchase those upgrades, but um, there it's also used as ammunition in a way for some of the moves. So like for those spells, um, for example... Um, Sorry, my computer's acting up on me. Um, it, like, so for the uh, for the lightning spell that uh, you'll see in the trailer, mm -hmm. um, that like costs ore to cast that. So as you're, you know, if you're using that, you can't just keep spamming it. You would have to kind of collect ore from enemies and whatever. Um, so for now, that's kind of the main use of that resource. In that regard, would ore be equivalent to both money and um, hearts? Y yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. All right, I, I can go with that, and i i get I get the sense that you're that you're not going to do much in the way of any of a item shop, in the in the typical sense. No, yeah, there are no like shops really. There are hardly any NPCs. Um, picture it more like Axiom Verge with a skill tree, and that's kind of what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And. I did look when I look at the over at the overlay of the of the castle. The other question mm -hmm. that ended up coming to mind is: Is there go is there going to be when it comes to cert, is there going to be certain fast travel points? Yes, and that's actually an interesting thing that I don't know if I want to spoil. Um, there will be quicker ways to move around the Nestrium. Although you're gonna have to uh, explore um, as you as you gain more abilities, and especially once you get the grappling hook, which is later, which is much later in the game. But um, you know, as you get these different abilities, moving around, you'll kind of unlock different shortcuts, and that will make moving around the tower faster, um, just for convenience sake. But um, there will be some some even more secretive ways to move around as you go, and it kind of has to do with uh, that sub dungeon concept that I that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, now, with that with that said, 
when it come when it came one of the things that you pointed out in the visual design is only using um 25 colors and i i i know it talks i know on the thing it talks about that being a deliberate focus but i'd like to get a bit of the method behind the madness so to speak <laughs> yeah uh, in terms of my choice of those colors, yeah. In terms of in terms of the choice of 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 only using such a small um, color palette. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's really just um, you know. So one of my biggest inspirations is obviously Shovel Knight, and uh, that game used the limitation very well because, and they're doing it with Mina the Hollower as well, um, where they're basically choosing like which aspects they limit in in a very stylistic way so like in shovel knight you know they they use a small color palette but it's still more colors than the original nes would have allowed and they use chiptune music but they're using uh, a, a better chip than the actual nes would have allowed and uh you know the background layers are limited but they're using better parallax than was possible at the time, you know? So it's like, they they recreate the feeling of limitation without actually reverting back to the exact technology that was used at the time. So I'm kind of trying to do the same thing with this game, like, you know, um, it's supposed to kind of look like a, a cross between something that could have been on the NES and something that would have been on the Super Nintendo. And, uh... Yeah, so it's just kind of in this, like, you know, made-up interim space between those two consoles. And, uh, you know, the music represents that as well. The graphics represent that. Um, so it's kind of retro-themed without looking like... It's it's retro-themed, but at the same time, I still want it to look, you know, modern, I guess, is the reason. Mm -hmm. Now... With that, with that, in, with that in mind. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to spoil any, um, any, bo any bosses. But since boss design is a crucial part to the cycle that that's within a, that's within a Metroidvania, um, have has there been thought given to making sure that um, boss design in, um, works within the sandbox that you've created with the Gigasword? Yeah, so what you see in the demo is that Sloan, you know, he takes that, like, downward stab to kill at the end, and that's just kind of a way to, like, rope everything back into the sword. Um, Sloan's a pretty simple boss, because you it's pretty much just a slugfest. It's like, you just go in, and you just have to beat him up, and there's not really any complicated, you know, uh, you know scenario that's going on. What I want to do later in the game is that some of the other bosses will be more akin to Zelda-style bosses, where, like, you know, uh, kind of like how in a Zelda game you would find the boomerang and then you would need to use it to, to kill the boss of that dungeon, you know, like maybe the boss is, like, hanging by ropes and you have to cut the ropes with the boomerang, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Gigasword, the equivalent would be, you know, after you get the charge attack, there's going to be a boss that, like, has a really big shield and, like, you have to break it or maybe it's like it has a big shell or something and you have to break the shell open to to be able to hit its weak spot and then you know it it you know grows the shell back or something like that if you don't do it fast enough um so yeah the the abilities that you get will definitely be uh tied to the boss fights as well in those areas mm -hmm. and with that with that in with that in mind, one of the other th one of the other things that I that I th that I, th I found kind of amusing, especially w regarding our talk of of um, fantasy settings, mm -hmm. is the is the way you've treated the um, nocturne. Yes. Um, especially with that whole especially with that whole different elves thing, because some people could argue that the nocturne are are your equi are your equivalent to elves. Um, I'd say I'd say not I'd say not exactly because they're not nearly as smug enough. Yeah. Yeah, the the I'm trying to think of where I get the inspiration from them. They're definitely not supposed to be based on elves. Um they're more like you know, I see I see them more Maybe it's just me, but I but 
the vibe that, the vibe that I got from them was more was more akin to warrior monks. Yeah, that's monk is definitely the right way to put it. And it's interesting that people are able to get vibes from them even though they're not even in the demo. Um and in the final game, you know, there are going to be full-on cutscenes where Ezra is speaking to uh, Amari, who is the main Nocturne, but also there might be some other Nocturne people that you'll get to either talk to or read, uh, you know, scriptures from or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll definitely get a better vibe of them once you, you know, are able to see the dialogue that goes on. Of but course, um, of course, I could go with the obvious route and say that one of the inspirations was the Chozo. Yeah, that's definitely another one. Um, they're pretty much just like. You know, they're very wise. They're, uh... <clears throat> One of my inspirations was actually the, um... I'm gonna forget the name of them. But, like, the... the the From Skyrim, the guys from High Hrothgar, like, those guys that, that live up on the top of the, t the, the mountain, um, that's kind of the idea that I get, is that, like, Nocturne, kind of, in a very monk sort of way, they, they kind of put emotions, like, aside, and they just live like based off of knowledge and 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 uh they, they they live very like factual lives um and omari you'll see is a bit different from that because he has sympathy for ezra and so that kind of sets him apart um but yeah they're very they're very monk like they they, they are strong and they fight when they need to um i've been t are you um an avatar fan uh last yeah. airbender yeah, I've d I've done I've done a few videos regarding regarding certain materials. I did I did two vid I did two episodes of the podcast um reconstructing the legend of Korra and I've um I've had some strong words regarding the Avatar Legends TTRPG project. <laughs> I don't know what that is. What's the Avatar Legends project? It is a official TTRPG use um of Avatar the Last Airbender. Last Airbender and and Legend oh, is that the one that they had on Kickstarter recently? Yeah, I okay, yeah, yeah, I saw it. I covered a couple articles discussing it and and covered the quick start. Um, I have issues with the design that they with the design and some of the choices that they made. Mm -hmm. Um, along with along with a question that I that I ended up asking that I'm probably not going to get an answer for, but I'm going to keep asking it whether or not <laughs> yeah. they, whether or not they're trying to. Make a game. Make a game for exploring the sandbox that is the four nation, the four or five nations, depending on the era. Or mm -hmm. is this for emulating stories from the TV shows? Yeah, it is kind of unclear, and it, I feel like it would have been cool. I forget exactly how it works, um, but you know, yeah, it, it, it seems like it takes place with the same characters from the show, and it, it almost would have been cooler if it was just like. They picked a different time period, and you could just totally make your own character or whatever. Um, if I'm be if I'm being honest, I think I th the problem that the problem that I the problem that I have with their design is the f is the fact that they that they're a little too gung ho on pre on presenting the stories that you can tell as being within the within the same timeline as the official canon, whereas. Most people that most people that I know who want to run, say, who want to run in a want to run stories in a given IP, don't want to be messing around with with official canon or with the characters within that canon. They want to build something on their own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I get that. The last time that I was part of a Doctor Who campaign, for instance, nobody was playing the Doctor. Nobody was playing as a Time Lord. They were all members of Unit. Mm -hmm. Um. In, and with some with something like Avatar, I'd th if I if I was asked to run that, I I would be far more interested in exploring some what if scenario, or right, or expo or exploring uh, exploring other incarnations of the Avatar that uh, that haven't been talked about. Um, mm -hmm. And as an as an aside, they they chose to they just they said that they were not going to allow the avatar to be playable because in their words some things should remain mysterious. I yeah. find th I find that ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. But I but I I I think I can see where you're going for. I'm guessing that you I'm guessing that in this regard you um you're drawing a bit on the air nomads with the nocturne. 
Um, a little bit. I was actually going to say just the straight up owl from the library is actually where a lot of the inspiration comes from. Yeah, but the owl was a dick. <laughs> yeah, I know. But so picture him, but a bit nicer. A bit. Yeah, a bit, a bit nicer. A little bit nicer. <laughs> um, just don't ask him how many lick, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The answer the, is um... the answer is still three. His library is the main source of inspiration for the area that's in the Gigasword demo, where it's the you know the place called the monastery, where there's obviously library stuff everywhere. And then as you move through the Nestrium, um, the other areas are kind of um, you know you'll you'll see like the different sort of wings that they have um, based on kind of the things that they study. You know, there's like a garden because they study herbology, and then there's uh, a, a place higher up where there's all these like uh, telescopes and stuff because they study astrology. Um, so that is kind of how the other areas are going to be themed. Mm -hmm. Now, take now taking that into taking that into account. Um, a lot of a lot of times, especially with, especially um, Met especially Metroidvania games that take place in a sing in a single in a single area or a single building, there's a it, there's a tendency to make each section of that building of that building almost like its own character with its own its own vibe, its own set of monsters, and its own music in some places. Mm -hmm. um, are you planning on doing that with the different areas within within the Nestrium? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, every area kind of has its own color palette, its own vibe, its own music, uh, its own boss. So yeah, they're very much uh, their own sort of. Uh, they're very different from each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with how? What would you be shoot? What would you be shooting for in terms of? Um, in terms of how long how long the main story might go might go cuz i real i realize there's going to be some moving parts on that and plus speedrunners is inevitable yeah it's tough to say because some people i watch beat the demo in like 20 minutes and then for other people it takes like an hour and a half mm -hmm. so there's a very wide range going on there and it, uh, if I was going to take the average, I would say based on the demo and based on my plans for the other areas and the length of those areas, it's probably, um, let me think, uh, I don't know, like, it'll be at least eight hours, if not ten, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Also, this and is a... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, and that's if you're moving at, like, a decent pace, you know, you could easily spend more on it if you're trying to get all the secrets and find everything, 100% the game, you know, that type of stuff. By the by the way, um, a bit of a bit of a dumb question, but did you? But whose idea was it to make a replica of the damn sword? Oh, um, I don't know whose idea it was. Um, my brother and I did that together, so it's actually like one of those old Nerf swords that we took foam and built the blade like around it, mm -hmm. uh, and then reinforced it with like PVC pipe on the inside and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's been fun to have that for like you know pictures and. We took it to a few events back when physical events were still happening before the virus. So, uh, yeah, it's been good to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just look at that and I just get flashbacks to the shard blade in um, Stormlight Archive. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but um, um, it's not it's not a seeable thing. It's it's a it's a book series. Oh, okay. But I realize I realize this is this is um. A bit of counting chickens, but one, one bit, one popular trend that I've seen, that I've seen, especially with Metroidvanias in the last few years, has been randomizers. Is that something that you've considered as a long-term idea? I actually had an idea for a stretch goal that would be um, that would have something to do with that. Um, so if the game does well enough, and if um, you know, as time goes on, if the uh, if it's something that I end up adding to, um, it would be a lot of fun to make some sort of like ran yeah to, to to use some sort of random aspect, maybe some sort of uh, like you know 
room swapping aspect or something like that. You know, it's not totally fleshed out yet, but yeah, it would be fun to pursue that. Yeah, that was that was something that was a, it was attempted with um, Bloodstained, but because of how that game works, they couldn't do a full randomizer. Mm -hmm. um, but I've seen that I've seen that plenty of times with um, things like Symphony of the Night and The Link to the Past, and even stuff like Resident. I think there's a Resident Evil Four randomizer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole. It's gotten to the point where it's a whole subtype of event at um, GDQ. Yeah. So it's some it's something that I it's something that I felt was worth um to worth tossing in there. Yeah, yeah, no it would be really interesting if it could if it could happen. Mm -hmm. Now with what would you say have been what would you say have been some of the big takeaways from the response to the demo? Um I've realized in the weeks following the release of the demo, just how puzzle-heavy that area is. And I feel like it's in a weird spot, or maybe it's not Maybe it's not that the game is in a weird spot, but, like, you, you, you can tell the different people that approach this game. There are people that come to it, and they just love it, and they take it exactly as it is. There are people that expect it to be more like Metroid. There are people that expect it to be more like Hollow Knight, and they're like, oh, well, like... There should be more moves that you can do, and then the other people are like, "Oh, there should be uh, more." You know, um, I've gotten a lot of great, you know, ideas and uh, suggestions from people as the demo has gone on. And uh, one of my biggest takeaways is that I feel like, you know, the monastery area that's in the demo right now um, could could use some more like combat centric areas uh, to split up all the puzzle solving. Um, and that will definitely something that that kind of hinges on is um, the different like once that area is more fleshed out and once it gets connected to the other areas that are going to be in the game that'll be a bit easier to design because right now the monastery is the only part of the game that exists so once you know the other areas are connected to it it'll be easier to know like where to hide the feathers and and to hide the other collectibles and stuff like that, and then to design, you know, once you have the main path designed, then you can start placing all those secret areas around, and uh, so the area, you know, the monastery will, will only get more and more fleshed out as development goes on, and I think the final product will be a, mo a lot more well-rounded than it is right now. Mm -hmm. Now, and with and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how how it how it develops and striking that balance between action and puzzle. Mm -hmm. Isn't it it is at times a bit of a um spinning plates scenario. Yeah. But with all but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness around here. Yeah, no, it's been great. Thank you so much for reaching out, and uh, I'm glad that we could talk. And um, yeah, I uh, the, the Kickstarter is ending soon, so I've got you know high hopes for it, and uh, we'll see what happens in these final days. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into Gigasword, go into different uh, Metroidvanias, or just to... Sh just to shit post about about how you, about how useless cer certain items were in some in some of the earlier games. <laughs> uh, the door is always open, as I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah, yeah. Anytime that you want to uh, shit on any board games that you have played and don't approve of, you can always reach out to me. <laughs> uh, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>